Now we continue our discussion talking about the cash flow elements and also the balance sheet. Also important, it's very important when you're putting together pro forma financial statements for a business plan to not only think about the income statement, but the cash flow and the balance sheet uh, for different reasons. Um, before we get into them in a little more detail, essentially the reason for the balance sheet is the balance sheet is a snapshot of your business, which essentially tells what's been invested, who's been, not who's been invested, but how much has been invested, how much is, what the assets of the business are, any liabilities that exist. So someone that's looking at the company and looking at possibly investing understands what's in the business and what they're purchasing. You're really buying the, a piece of the balance sheet when you buy in. The operation is what drives the value in the balance sheet, but it's really the assets and liabilities in the balance sheet that you're purchasing. The cash flow, on the other hand, which we'll talk about first here, is what talks, what describes the value because cash flow and growing cash flow over the long term is what determines, determines the valuation of the business. How much the business is worth, what someone is willing to pay for it, what their investment is. So let's talk about that first. You start with the earnings before interest and taxes or EBIT. That is what the operations is able to generate in the form of cash from its business. And in, a, in ventures like this, we typically use cash accounting rather than accrual accounting. We won't talk too much about accrual accounting. I'll reference it in a little bit later. But we don't talk too much about it. But mostly it's the cash that the business can generate. So you're running a restaurant or you're operating something where you're selling a, a new type of furniture or doors or something like that. Um, or any other new automobile, electric automobile, whatever you decide to, it is your business is doing. And based upon your generating revenue, you're selling these units, you're building them, and you're putting them on the shelf, and you're shipping them to people, you're running your operations, your location, you're paying everybody, you have your employees, paying your rent. All of that is said and done, a given month, given two months, given quarter, given year, there's so much money left over, your EBIT, that's your EBIT. From that, though, you have stakeholders that care about you, and that is, and care about your money and want some of it, and that would be your bankers if you've borrowed money, your interest, and also your taxes that you owe for the profits that you make from your business. After you take those out, you're down at your net income number. That is how much money is left over for investors who are equity investors. Right? And you still have to pay them, although much of the money, if you don't have a dividend, the money stays in the business. But you have essentially that much money that you're, you're, you're going to accumulate if you decide not to send it out to your investors, which startup businesses rarely dividend out their profits. They keep them in the business. Why? Because they have plenty of opportunities to invest it and grow. And that's where you talk about your investments. What kind of equipment do you need to buy? What kind of equipment have you bought? That is, you might buy a new piece of computer equipment, a new technology, a 3D printer, something like that. You may fit out your office space. You may, if you're a restaurant, you have to buy kitchen equipment. You may have a whole list of things that you want to add as you generate some cash flow going forward. All sorts of things associated with supporting and sustaining your business with pieces of capital equipment that last longer than one period. They generate their value over time. That's really what capital equipment is all about. And lastly, you have working capital, which is the amount of money that you have to put into the business. You invest in the business. It has value benefiting the business going forward in terms of supporting its operations, but it actually stays in the business once you put it in. For example, inventory. As long as you have a growing business, you always have to have inventory. And interestingly enough, as your business gets bigger and bigger, you need more and more inventory. So you're continually investing in inventory. It turns over quickly, but the amount in total that is in invested in all of the inventory you have goes up. So you have to be investing in working capital just to keep your business viable, and particularly if it's growing. If it's growing fast, your inventory is growing fast. If you're growing 100%, and it's not unusual for some businesses to grow at 100% a month for the first several months. Well, that means your inventory is growing at 100% per month. So if you have $50,000 in inventory the first month, you're going to have $100,000 the second month, $200,000 the third month, 
$400 in the fourth month. So you're putting money in buying inventory. Now, sure, it flows out when you buy, when someone buys your equipment, but you have to replace it. Not only that, you have to put more in because you're growing so fast. The same is true if you're offering credit to customers, accounts receivable. You're sending them invoices. And they're, they're not paying you cash right away. They're essentially, you're essentially letting them borrow money to purchase. If you're doing catering or you're working for businesses, that's the sort of thing that happens all the time. Those things have to go in. That's your working capital. Now, for the purposes of our project, I have some calculations in a spreadsheet, which I'll go over in class. But that, those calculations, if you want to talk about them, we can. But, don't, but keep in mind, it's your responsibility to have working capital baked into your cash flow statement. You can use the equations that are there, but you're the one that has to verify and make sure that you're OK with them. So we can talk about that. Or you can be specific and forecast these items directly. Okay. Uh, once you've taken out all the investments from your net income, that is your free cash flow. That is how much money the business is generating even after you've invested in the future of the business. So essentially, your operation, operating income, is how much the business generates in the past, but you have to invest in the future. You take that and you put it in. What's left after you invest in the future, as well as the past, is your free cash flow. Free cash flow by the month, first year, by the quarter, by the year. You can look at that trend and based upon discounted cash flow modeling, which we'll talk about in a later discussion, you can determine how much this business is worth. Is it worth a billion? Is it worth a million? Is it worth a thousand? Is it worth nothing? And you do that by looking at your cash flows over time, forecasting them, and then do some modeling discounted cash flow analysis. And that tells you what your business is worth. This is one of the reasons why the cash flow analysis is so important. So what's missing? As I said, we're doing cash accounting, not accrual accounting. I haven't mentioned depreciation and amortization. Whenever one does this and you're really looking at developing and getting professional investors involved and bankers involved, depreciation and amortization comes into this story. Depreciation means you actually have a physical asset that you take, uh, you take uh, the benefits of over time. Amortization means you take the benefits over time, but you don't really have a physical asset. Like if you develop software, and that software works for you over the course of three or four years, you might amortize the expense of developing that software, even though it's not a physical asset. But it's not something that you'd you get the benefit of it in the same month you build it. So you're investing in the future, and that's what amortization is all about. All right. So that's what is not really included here, but there is a little bit that we'll talk about. I don't expect this to be in your business case, business plan for the class project. Um, if you do want to add that, that's, that's extra. You need to understand it if you do this for real, but it's not something that we focus on because it's really more of an accounting question than an entrepreneurship question. So let's look at the balance sheet. As I mentioned at the beginning, the balance sheet is really the capital view of the company. It's what someone who is putting money in knows they're buying whenever they invest. Say they're giving you $100,000 and they get 10% of the company. They want to know 10% of what? Sure, it's the operations, but what else is it? What assets are there if we have to liquidate and sell? Do you have any cars or equipment that we can get you know, money for if we have to sell it? Can we sell inventory? Also, what bankers are first? Generally, banks and loans are superior in, um, in terms of getting their returns before the equity investors. So if you owe 100000 or 300000 or 400000 in, in debt to banks, they're the ones that will take the first value out of the company. So we need to understand that. It's this capital view of the business. One looks like sometimes you think about planning backwards in the sense that you're, you're feeling like looking at what's happened in the future and then figuring out what to do in the present. Um, but we're really not doing that in this particular scenario. When you plan forward, you don't actually have the benefit of looking at your accounts and seeing how much money you have in your various checking accounts. You don't have that. 
you have to look forward and say how much money will we have left over if we buy all of these things. So typically when one plans a balance sheet in a going forward basis, you don't plan the cash account. That's not the first thing you plug in. The cash account is really what's called a plug. It's the last thing that's calculated. Why? Because you know you have the fundamental equation of accounting. Assets are equal to liabilities plus equities. You know you're going to borrow money. You know you're going to have equities you have. You know you're going to buy assets. One of those assets is cash. You know what all these things are going to cost. How much cash will you have left over when you equate the two? You want to make sure that your assets and your liabilities and equities are always equal. So there has to be one cell in your equation that's calculated, and that's your cash account. You don't want to add up assets and liabilities separately and hope they, hope they match. No, you add up assets except for cash, liabilities, and equities, and then cash is the balancing account. It's the one that you use to balance between the two. It can be positive or it can be negative, but you make sure that, those, that assets always balance with liabilities and equities. If your cash account comes out to be negative, what that means is you need more equity. You need the investors to give you more money, more paid-in capital, or you spend less on property, plant, and equipment. Right? What you're trying to do is see and watch your cash account and make sure that it stays positive over the, in course of the, the entire course of the, time, of, the, uh, of the planning cycle. If cash goes negative, that means you don't have enough money, and you need to go get more money from investors as paid-in capital or potentially from a banker as a loan, which is really hard in a startup. So it's t traditionally or typically additional paid-in capital. Okay, So that's where you figure out where the money went by looking at the paid-in capital. You find out you need a million dollars in order to keep your capital, your cash account positive. You bought a lot of startup equipment and that sort of thing. That all goes on your asset accounts. You have inventory that you need. Uh, that comes out, that's also an asset account. You have some accounts receivable. You're running the operations, which is the uh, cumulative profit or loss line item. And then from that on, you figure out how much cash you need. And that becomes what your, um, what your, your cash account becomes positive. That becomes the amount of paid-in capital that you need and that you have. So that is uh, one of the things you use the balance sheet for. Once you know all the equipment and the assets and the inventory that you need, and you could figure out maybe what sort of debts you might have if you're able to finance a car or whatever. You would typically need to have a, uh, a guarantor if you're a startup. Either you're personally accountable and personally guarantee it, or you have someone else, a parent or a colleague, guaranteed a loan. Then you might have some liabilities on your balance sheet as you put that together. Okay? So that's what you do when you go about calculating your balance sheet. And again, we'll look at this when we actually develop our models. But keep in mind, you can't just not do a balance sheet. You have to do it. We will do a very, very simple balance sheet because it actually is quite a simple analysis. It's like your checkbook. It's that simple whenever you do it for a startup business. In actual accounting, it can become very complicated with deferred accounts, deferred revenue, and all that sort of thing, deferred expense, deferred tax accounts. You have all these various things, and you have accrual accounting, so it can be very complicated. Not so. This is not that difficult in the venture. So that's what we'll talk about when we go and, uh, and do, it, do our actual projects going forward uh, within the class. Next video, however, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the income statement balance sheet cash flow and the sorts of things that are in it, just as a way to summarize what we need when we put together our pro forma financial statements in the business plan. And that will be next.